Say good morning. Can you say hi? Maybe I just want to be cute. Can you say hi? Rico, say hi. Okay. Say hi. Good morning, Diane. Good morning, Joan. Hey, guys. Can you hear the kestrel in the background? I don't know if you guys can hear that. Hey, Sylvia, long time no see. And Ray, down in Florida. Sarah, good morning, everybody. Thought I'd start off with our co-host, Rico. Hey, Barbara. Good morning, good morning. Yeah. He has me trained well, and I don't mind. Good morning, Sharon. Morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. I have a cold. Um, <clears throat> good morning, Sean. Just think a week ago, Sean, you were sitting right here. Uh, Felicia, good morning, everybody. Um, so yeah, excuse me if I cough throughout our live stream. I have a cold that's just lingering. Um, hey, there's Crystal, our social media director, joining us this morning. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm going to take you with me to go feed Jefferson this morning. Keep an ear out for Kestrel in the background. Good morning, Lori. Um, hey everybody, my name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center teaching people about using applied behavior analysis and positive reinforcement with animals with the focus on exotics, but definitely not limited to. And we do that through our live streaming services. We've got a lot of new things happening and coming up. Um, next week, I will be in Chicago, Jeannie, in Chicago. Um, speaking at the Midwest Bird Expo. Um, also, uh, I will begin next weekend. I have been asked to be a co-lecturer for a college course in Chicago at St. Xavier University, um, zoo genetics and biology course. Um, I'll be doing the animal behavior and training. And uh, part of that will be in person and the other part will be online via live streams. Yeah. So, what else is going on? Today we're going to do a Q&A. I like to do Q&As every once in a while. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Last week we were having a workshop here. Pam was working with Rico um, <coughs> and doing great. Um, I'm out here today with Quincy and Levi. Um, speaking of Levi and our deaf dogs, um, Dr. Karen Becker just uploaded an interview. She uh, interviewed me on deaf dogs. Uh, I think she just posted that like two or three days ago. Um, I shared it last night on the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page. <clears throat> so Rico seems to know when Coffee with the Critters is, and he stations right there. Hey, Cheryl, morning, Stacy. Morning, everybody. Um, Last week in our workshop, I showed how um, Suki, um, because I have limited training with her, um, she would attack me as soon as I walked into a cage. So I've been working with her and successfully in her cage and doing safe recalls with her back and forth. Yep. Yeah. You like that? You like your head scratches? Yeah. And in the parrot project, hey Nicole, we're getting we were just talking about nesting behaviors and that's exactly what you're seeing right there. That's a nesting behavior with Coco, our umbrella cockatoo. Um, <clears throat> I know his reinforcers and we've been successfully getting him to perch and interact with toys at the top of his cage for longer periods of time. Good morning, Adrian, who um, just got a couple new puppies. Welcome to your new life being turned upside down. <laughs> Can I pet? Can I pet? No? Um, so yeah, also in the Parrot Project, we're working on different schedules of reinforcement to create duration. Let's see what Suki wants here. Let's go feed a Kestrel. Let's go in the other room and then we'll get started with our Q&A. Um, so Oh, it looks like the Kestrel's already feeding himself. A lot of times we've got, uh, oh, oh, by the way, Mary Lou has gone back to nature's nursery um, temporarily. 
that um, that enclosure will next um, house a mammal, probably from a zoo, um, that we've been working on, and we'll be. Um, that's right, Rock. Our um, zoo live streams have started back up in level two last week, so you guys wanted it, and we're gonna give it to you. So I did some live streaming with a Quadamundi, with several Quadamundis and a giraffe. Trying to figure out how to hold the tripod. Let's go feed a Kestrel real quick before we get coffee with the critters started. Stay right here. So the Kestrel has come in for training. Um, hello, Algeria. The Kestrel has come in from for training from uh, Nature's Nursery, a wildlife rehabilitation center, and. Um, we are getting it recall trained. It is definitely recall trained, and um, we're getting it scale trained. We're going to start, we're, we're working on recall from person to person, and he is eating his leftover dinner. <coughs> Here he is, eating his dinner. Would you like a fresh one? I'm not going to get him out today. So your breakfast is almost as big as you. There you go. Usually I don't free feed like that. I will um, work him for his breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and we get him out and fly him around um, <clears throat> and get him going from person to person. We're training the Kestrel. He's non-releasable because he can fly, but he can't fly very well. Good morning, Steve. So I work with wildlife rehabilitation centers. <clears throat> and if the animal is unreleasable, that is the only way they come to see me. Otherwise, I want no contact with them because they need to remain very afraid of humans to exist and live successfully in the wild. Um, so one week from today, I'll be speaking at the Midwest Bird Expo. Two weeks from today, I will be speaking at the Ohio Wildlife Rehabilitators Conference. And so looking forward to it. Um, thank you, we'll be speaking several times and our workshop is sold out. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with our Q&A. Oops, sorry. If anybody has questions, go ahead and let me know. Um, we work with a wide variety of animals um, if I work with domestics, I do train several domestics, um, <clears throat> but if I do work with domestics, I prefer to work with um, um, animals that can't hear or can't hear and see um, because those are great educators for me to use environmental and what applied behavior analysis is all about is using a, um, environmental events to control behavior. Um, we all need to keep our animals under control for their safety and for ours. Um, so here we show people how to do that and work through behavior issues without the use of force, coercion, or aversives. We get the animal to do, want to do what we need it to do, such as um, <clears throat> medicating parrots. Yes. We do a lot of prep of getting the animals ready for the veterinary exam. The reason is, is because that has to happen. Good morning, Pat. That has to happen. Um, and we don't wait for the vet exam to happen or to be needed in order to start the training. So um, like Rico here, for example, is trained to um, allow me to walk up and enclose them in a towel and do nail trims, do whatever I have to do, pass them off to the vet tech um, and the veterinarian. We're doing the same with the dogs. And in our level one membership, um, we will do dog training in level one. Um, you'll see that this past week, we have been working with dogs, getting them on a veterinary table, um, exam table, to get prepared for the vet exam. And that one was a big one. Um, what am I feeding them right now? Who? The parrots? Um, I was just feeding Rico pine nuts. So let me scroll back. I don't know if somebody had a question. Um, 
Stacy, hey Stacy, good to see ya. We have a deaf and blind pup staying with us at my office while his family is away. Any tips on making his stay less stressful? Yeah, Stacy, um, I didn't bring Snow out here this morning. Snow is our deaf and blind puppy um, who's been here with us uh, mid-November. It will be a year, believe that. Um, so when an animal is missing one or more of their senses, senses, the rest of their senses became, become heightened. Um, I noticed somebody posted last night on my personal Facebook page when I posted a picture of snow, they said um, that might be good because they can't hear the thunder. Yeah, they may not be able to hear the thunder, uh, but they can feel it for sure. And if they do not understand contingencies or it's paired with an aversive or unknown, um, that can send an animal into overstimulation, uh, beginning fear and um, phobic behaviors. Like this past year, Stacy, with snow, um, I was speaking in Seattle right before July 4th, and this would have been snow's first 4th of July. I really wanted to stay in Seattle, but instead I flew home to be with her um, and we sat on the deck while fireworks were going off all around us. I stayed to be with her um, to immediately pair that vibration um, with the positives. So every single time um, a firework would go off and you felt that boom, I would play with her and give her a toy in her mouth. And within um, a couple of minutes, um, I could tell she was fine with it. She wasn't even re really reacting to the fireworks. So if you have a deaf and blind pup, Stacy, I would, um, like I said last week in our workshop, animals are always looking for information. They are always searching for information. So just give it to them. Um, I know if the touch doesn't send the dog into, um, hey Ashley, if the touch doesn't send the dog into overstimulation, a lot of times, um, like I like to train Snow, our deaf and blind puppy, to just target the side of her face to the side of my knee. And a target is when you teach um, an animal to touch a particular body part to an object, target, um, I'm target training Rico right now to accept medication. So he's looking at, instead of this being an aversive, um, he's looking at it like, oh, are we getting started on our meds? Um, so a target, like I teach Snow to target the side of her head to the side of my knee to teach her to heal. And then I keep my hand on her back in the beginning as we're walking to give her guidance. I could tell she wants to know where I'm at and if she can't find me, she'll start spinning. So instead, I just give her that information that she's looking for. Um, you can do a lot with, I highly suggest just train her, train her. Um, Snow knows that when she's doing the behavior I'm asking for, her bridge is a tap on her chest. So when she feels that is a conditioned reinforcer, that's something <coughs> I've had to shape. So all I did with her in the beginning was touch her chest, food in her face, touch her chest, food in her face, touch her chest, food in her face. So a neutral stimulus paired with a positive reinforcer. So that was giving her information. So when she would start to follow me, touch her chest, boom. Food. So then I started seeing the behavior of her targeting and following me starting to increase. Now, um, I just started working with her last week. Here's something else I always say to people, <clears throat> and I've written a couple of papers on it, meaning um, don't punish curiosity in an animal. If you have a curious animal, the sky's the limit in what you can train. And so many times I see curiosity punished. For example, let me give you an example. Um, 
and animals curious about a new object in the environment. The person goes over, picks up the object, and puts it in the animal's face. Um, the animal is always the one that determines the positive reinforcer and the punishers, the aversives, not us. It is always them. So if they're afraid of this new object and you go and put it in front of their face, um, I see people take too big of steps and punish that curiosity because then um, neutral stimulus or new things in the environment, hey Sandy, are paired with things that should be fearful. So if I'm working, good morning Beth, if I'm working with an animal that seems curious with an object, for example, just like a new box, um, I am going to present it at the animal's pace. Let me show you because Levi here, our deaf dog, um, his fear of things going over his head has been intermittently reinforced, meaning once in a while someone will put something over his head or carry something over his head that's fearful, so he starts becoming, what are you doing? Um, fearful of anything that looks like it might be coming over his head. So where do I begin? With something he may not be fearful of. Um, let me grab my treat pouch and give you some examples. Okay, so Levi cannot hear, so I've gotta work with hand signals and body language with him. All right, so one thing I'm gonna start with with him is something which he may be comfortable with. I'm not sure if he's gonna be comfortable with this over his head, so I'm gonna get his attention. Gotta find a treat that he likes. So maybe let's just start with my hand. So this is why I make sure don't. I say keep your animal used to change. This is how you can do it. They're always looking for information. These two dogs right now are looking, oops, sorry, looking for information. What do you want me to do? Sorry. So I'm going to guide them by giving them information. Okay, so let's start with the box. This is his bridge since he cannot hear. So pace, the pace at which I move could be a punisher or a reinforcer and I'm running out of treats in which they like. So I've got a treat here that I don't think Levi likes, but I will not ask a behavior if I cannot positively reinforce it. Okay? <clears throat> so pace. I'm watching how fast it goes over his head. Let's see if he likes this. If not, i got to run next to the next room. How, am I, how do I know if I'm working with an effective reinforcer? <coughs> if the behavior I'm asking for um, maintains or increases. So I can increase the pace by carefully reading body language, making sure I've got calm behavior. So I can speed up the pace. So if I started at that pace, 
I guarantee you, because I know Levi, I, he would have bolted him. So then we can move to new objects. There's a box full of syringes that we just purchased for some med medical training, vet training. New box. because it's probably going to punish his behavior of sitting there. Quincy's like, yeah, this is easy. Now let's move up to a very large canister. So, before, I put it over his head. Levi has a history of running when something moves over his head. Right, Rico? So I did notice that he didn't follow it with his eyes. That's fine, but I'm going to pay close attention to it because that is also a sign. I need to read his body language at the same time. When he stops engaging with his eyes, That is also a sign that it's too much for him. And he'll, he's gonna walk away. So I pay attention to those antecedents or consequences. And I'm gonna end the training session there. Okay. So don't punish curiosity. Um, so many people do. And that is, that can be a conditioned reinforcer or punisher um, of your animal staying calm with the presence of something new in the environment. And you can create a, you can create behaviors labeled as fearful and phobic by doing that. When I see a curious animal, I move at the animal's pace. Um, I move at the animal's pace and I reinforce calm. I introduce new objects, reinforcing calm behavior. Um, I do it with all the birds, I do it with the pig, I do it with any new animal that comes in here. Um, did you like that, Adrian? Yeah, so, um, <coughs> Julie. Can I do that with a muzzle to get a dog used to a muzzle? Absolutely. Absolutely. You want me to work with some muzzle training right now? Um, I can do that. Um, Quincy has to be muzzled when she goes to a vet, and she has a vet appointment on Tuesday. Um, let me grab their muzzle. You don't want to um, push the animal past its comfort level, or you are going to shake it something to be feared. So these animals are already partially muzzle trained. Um, even the pig. So watch their body language when they see the muzzle. Say, oh yeah, give it to me. Give it to me. Put the muzzle on me because good things happen when the muzzle's on you. So this is a process called shaping. Now, why am I reinforcing Quincy? Well, not reinforcing Quincy, I'm reinforcing behavior. You don't reinforce an animal, you reinforce behavior. You don't punish an animal, you punish behavior. Let me do that again. What? 
behavior of Quincy am I reinforcing? <clears throat> so right there, we, you can see we um, created duration, which was our last, I think our second to the last podcast. Anybody want to guess? Why am I, what behavior am I reinforcing with Quincy? And so many people forget to do this, and we just discussed this in level one the other day. Calm, exactly. Um, calm and just sitting there. I, if, if I only reinforce Levi, she's gonna start coming into the picture, reinforce, if I only reinforce the behaviors with Levi, she's gonna start coming into the picture. So I'm telling her just staying there is what's earning you reading. Right, Rico? And I could turn around with the other hand and reinforce the behavior of Rico sitting here stationing. Okay, so I'm sitting here training three animals now. If I want Rico to stay on that station, he's doing so good, I want to do this one more time. So Quincy's not that far in her muzzle training, so let me start a little bit with Quincy. Watch the difference between Quincy and Levi. So we've got some shaping to do here. Let me reinforce Rico back here. I've got some work to do with Quincy. And do it fast. I like to train fast. So um, we do all kinds of things like this, like focus and control exercises. Um, <clears throat> they love to be trained. It's mentally and physically stimulating. If you're actually using positive reinforcement training, it is one of their favorite forms of enrichment. That's why we train, because we like to empower animals. Okay, Levi, I need you over here. Sorry, Quincy, here. Sit. Right here. Sit. Stay. Sit. Stay. So I'm going to pull them into view. all the time here because I stay. I need them to pay close attention to me at all times because if an accident is getting ready to happen, I need your 100% attention. These are focused. This is for Adrian. These are focus and control exercises. Watch this. I'm going to keep one in a down while I call the other one to me. Quincy, come. Quincy, come. Sit. Good. Except for we do this with longer distances. Is he down? So I'm going to call Levi to me now.
नेक्स्ट स्टार करें हाय मिठो गुड जॉब वेरी गुड Okay, now, the, and I will do that with our parrots as well. Um, I'll keep one stationed while I call another one. And um, that's one of my favorite focus and control exercises because that animal is really paying attention to your body language and really paying attention to um, to have one in a down position while the other one gets up and runs, like we usually do that long distances, um, while the other one gets up and runs, because that behavior of the other one, the pace of the other one getting up and running, um, tends to pull the other dog out of the sit position and they take off running as well. Same thing with birds. When birds hear another bird's wings flap, you tend to see all the birds take off at once. So I intentionally will ask one bird to station while I call one to me, ask this one to station while I call the other one to me. That's right, Rico. And they really have to focus on what you're asking. Um, that he helps keep um, or get control in an environment that can go out of control very easily. Uh, let's take some more questions. Do you ever use touching praise? All the time, Cindy. Um, we use praise here a lot as a reinforcer. We had a dog in for training yesterday um, that was fed right before it came here. Uh, the only thing we, so we had to uh, resort to other reinforcers. So um, we used a lot of play, um, just the opportunity to train um, was the reinforcer behind wanting to stay engaged. Um, I will use praise a lot as a reinforcer. Have you guys seen Rico do his somersaults? I'm not reinforcing him those behaviors with treats. I'm reinforcing those behaviors with Rico's reinforcers, which is um, clapping. Um, tone of voice. So I do this quite a bit. Quite a bit. Yeah. Because Levi's deaf, I need him, I need to reinforce eye contact and him looking for me all the time. Um, praise is a big reinforcer, so am I using a positive reinforcer for the behavior of keeping him staying right here? I uh, do believe so. Um, so yeah, we use, um, and we just got done discussing this in our membership program, how reinforcers are so much more than food. So much more than food. Um, I think I've even posted that several times on our Facebook page. Anybody else have any questions? Um, oh, sorry, I didn't scroll down. Um, yeah, Sylvia says, yes, I've had dogs so full but wanted to train so bad just to get reinforcement. Yeah, and it's probably also that opportunity to engage. And so many times um, I will see the bridge. Um, a bridge is a sound or signal that tells the animal that's a particular behavior that's earning you this reinforcer that's coming as soon as I can get it to you. So many times, um, like here with RICO, um, <laughs> the bridge, which is the word G-O-O-D, I'm not gonna say it because so many animals here know what it is. They're gonna turn and look at me for uh, training to start or reinforcers to be delivered. Um, that the bridge becomes the positive reinforcer. A bridge is a conditioned reinforcer. It is a neutral stimulus that is um, consistently paired with the primary reinforcer, a reinforcer of high value, that the word G-O-O-D, or the bridge, um, then becomes 
the positive reinforcer many times. And a lot of times when I'm working with wildlife, injured wildlife that cannot be released, that has to stay for education programs, um, food isn't gonna work because that animal wants nothing to do with you. They wanna keep you as far away from them as possible. Um, so there's different approaches that I take in that situation, but a lot of times I tell people, in the beginning, with some animals, the only thing I have to work with is food because that animal wants nothing to do with me because maybe it has a history of people being paired with aversives. That animal wants nothing to do with me. <clears throat> so in the beginning, the only thing I have to work with is food. But through consistency and constantly paying attention to that animal's body language, and letting that animal know, I know you're fearful, this is not gonna happen. It starts to build a line of trust and pretty soon, food was the reinforcer, but the opportunity to engage with you becomes the positive reinforcer because you have effectively paired yourself um, with the animal, the delivery of the animal's positive reinforcers and body language understanding body language. Even though so many cues that we give are verbal, such as hear, come, whatever, sit, um, a lot of times that animal's reading your body language. So many times when people come in here with the dogs, they say, oh, I don't know why I'm speaking to them. I know they're deaf. And I was like, no, speak to them because they're reading your body language. And if you start changing your body language, your body language changes when you sit there and try to think about, okay, nothing should come out of my mouth. So your movements get jerky. Um, so I tell people, keep talking to them because your body language changes when you don't, if you're not used to not talking to them. What is, uh, Lori says, what is the best way to start training three large dogs? Do I need to do each individually first and then as a group? That is a great question, Lori. <clears throat> pending on your approach um, and pending on the level of complexity, um, a lot of time I love working with numerous animals at once because I've got to be quick, accurate, um, paying attention to each individual animal and making sure I'm accurately communicating through bridging and training and body language. Um, but if I'd say to make it easier and the most success, successful, I would train each animal individually, depending on the behavior you're wanting to train. And then, um, so for example, if you're training three dogs to station, um, you can train each animal individually and then bring in two and train them both together and then bring in, switch to the other two, train those together, then bring in all three and train them together. Um, for example, we do, let me get my microphone on. I'm gonna do some distance training here with you guys real quick. Today happens to be all about dogs and I'm not meaning it to be that way. Um, let me show you because we will train all th two of our dogs and the pig at the same time. Hey Puff, um, let me get some of these treats in my treat pouch. Because I'm gonna show you something I started implementing again the other day. Because I need animals to be separated here because if they're not, there can be uh, a dangerous situation getting ready to happen. I cannot have any of the dogs go into the parrot's cages because those parrots could do some serious danger to those dogs pretty quick. Serious damage. So this is something I worked on the other day. Quincy is not used to this station. This is a permanent station on the floor. That's Milo, the pig station. And then you guys see the X's on the floor outside the bird cages. Those are on purpose. That's where mammals need to plant their behinds while cage doors are opened. And we will leave cage doors open while we go in and service the enclosure. Um, so let me show you.
I'll do this from a distance. This is what I do every night when I'm feeding the animals. <coughs> I'm gonna get Quincy on that station and let's put Levi on the X right there outside of Coco's cage. <laughs> what do you think, Murray? that teaches the animal good the animal contingency
uh, point a couple things out that's going on. Good. See why your bridge is so important? Who told you that? Um, let me end this training session. I want to talk about what just happened. Good. Okay. Um. Hi. So I want to talk about a couple of things that just happened. Um, this behavior is new. These behaviors are new. The sitting on the X's are not new. Um, Quincy sitting on Milo Station, that is new. Um, we just did that for the first time the other day. Um, so you can see that I was struggling to keep her on her station. And then Levi kept coming off of his, his target. I was moving way too fast. I was making too big of steps in my shaping plan. Shaping is reinforcing real small approximations towards the target behavior. I thought it would go a lot better than that, actually, because it went so well the other day. Um, so something has changed. Or I just haven't trained it enough. Um, and that's what? That's what we show in our live streams in the membership program. That's what makes them so popular is um, maybe we move to the other room is the fact that <coughs> so I'm identifying Rocky talking is reinforcing Murray screaming. Is the fact that um, it's live stream training so you get to see when things there is no editing peekaboo there's no editing you get to see the mistakes if you don't see them i point them out to you and then i show you how i try to change them um so i identified a In that training session, I identified a punisher, and I also identified a reinforcer behind an undesired behavior getting ready to start. Did you guys hear that? Um, so I saw an aversive starting to be shaped. <laughs> Did you guys see it? Let me move down to your guys' comments. Um, Did you see the body language in Levi the last time he was on his stage on the X? Um, he showed because I know him, I understand his body language. He showed uh, body language of not being comfortable next to Coco, okay? Um, so it's only a punisher if the future rate of that behavior of him sitting on that X. It's only a punisher if the future rate of the behavior of him sitting on the X starts to decrease um, <coughs> and it's a positive punisher because something is introduced to the environment so Coco's proximity I'm still trying to identify the punisher but I think it's Coco's proximity to Levi so did you see what I tried to do next I was like okay we've got some work to do here and I don't have time to do it in this particular coffee with the critters Yes, so Melissa, you did see that. Coco was an aversive to Levi. Levi was not comfortable with Coco in close proximity. And I haven't recently been asking the dogs um, to sit on those X's. We're getting ready to get those that started again. Um, 
So yeah, Melissa says it was amazingly clear. Yeah. So that's when I switched and said, okay, come over in front of Rico's cage instead. And you saw there at the ear, at the end, the ears dropped down and he turned around and walked away. So I was like, I am not going to continue asking for that, especially in those biggest steps. Or I could do what's called poison the cue. I could pair my training with aversives, which is going to positively punish the future behavior of the dog's um, response, their, uh, their pace in reacting to what I ask because I'm knowingly or unknowingly pairing my training with an aversive. Um, that's what's called poisoning the cue. And if you are not getting the behaviors you're wanting, there's several things to look for to make sure you're not doing, but that is one of them. Um, so those, both of those behaviors need a lot more training. Hey, Shannon, um, both of those behaviors need a lot more training. And you see how I just totally cut Levi out of the training at the end. I should have actually done some things a little bit different, but that's okay. Um, but what I started focusing on was, love you too, Shannon. Um, what I started focusing on was um, just Quincy. But something else I wanted to point out, thank God we got out of there because it's an ex audible explosion in there right now. Um, so many times when people are training and the desired behavior you're asking doesn't happen, it was happening, but then the animal, say for example, the animal has moved away, do not get frustrated. Because when I see that happen, I'm like, ding, ding, light bulb's gonna go off in this animal's head any minute. Reinforcers were being delivered for when I was here, 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 I get up and move away. I don't say no, I don't get frustrated, I just stop delivering the reinforcer. And many times you'll see the animal go, well, nothing's happening over here, so let's go back over here. Ding, 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 ding. That's what's called teaching contingency. The animal learns that if this, then this. Here's another behavior that we've trained. Um, in order for an undesired behavior to change, it has to be replaced with another behavior. I'm gonna turn the camera around and you're going to see um, a behavior that has, it may just look like a vulture on her perch. Yeah, so um, this is Nature's Nursery's Education Turkey Vulture. I'm getting ready to go train her as soon as this live stream is over. But that perch is there on purpose because this is where um, a lot of our enrichment volunteers come in this room and make enrichment for the animals. Well, what was happening is Willie, the turkey vulture, would sit outside the door. One of the no most dangerous places to be in proximity with a turkey vulture is with them on the ground. Um, so they would call me and say, hey, Willie's sitting outside the door. And I was like, okay, what's the reinforcer behind her sitting outside the door? And we identified it. It was proximity to people. So I said, in order to change this behavior, let's make it a lot easier for her to get her reinforcer. So I pulled a perch up outside the window. She seems to really want to watch the people in here working. So we just made it a lot easier for her to do so while we prevent um, an undesired behavior from happening. If you open up that door, she's going to lunge at you. I don't even want that to happen once. She has a long history of that in her former enclosure. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, so identify why the undesired behavior happens. Because if you can identify why the undesired behavior happens, you've identified the reinforcer. Once you have that, now you can put together a really effective training plan for an alternate behavior. It was proximity. We made that a lot easier for her to do, and that's where she flies now, instead of right there. And we can easily come and go outside, in and out of the center. Um, so, 
With that being said, I could possibly take one more question. Um, let's see. Hey, thanks. Um, Crystal posted our um, link to our memberships. So if, hey, Pam, good to see you in here. If you are liking these live streams, we do these once a week. Um, sometimes I do these once a day. We do that within the pig project, the parrot project, the deaf dog project, the snow project. We have um, our membership program, level one and level two. Level one is for um, companion animal lovers. Level two is more for people that are professional trainers or want more activity on a weekly basis, including podcasts, live streams. Um, we have different projects in there for free. We have another um, project getting ready to happen within level two. We started our zoo training is happening again within level two. Speaking of zoo training, I will be at a zoo uh, outside of Chicago this time next week. Not sure if I can live stream from there, but um, I will be having coffee with the critters next weekend and it will probably be with Jason Crean. I'll be with Jason in Chicago next week and I'll be live streaming from the Midwest Bird Expo. The following week, I will be hitting the road, on the road with Levi and Cello, our roller pigeon, to give a workshop for the Ohio Wildlife Rehabilitators Conference. Um, so I do plan on still doing my coffee with the critters the next couple weeks. We have a fundraiser getting ready to start on um, the second week in November for Nancy Forrester. Patricia Sund will be flying to the Animal Behavior Center. That is the first time I have made that public. <laughs> um, I did mention it in the Parrot Trail Project the other day, and we're going to be doing live stream fundraising for Nancy for Forrester of Nancy Forrester's Secret Garden in Key West, Florida. Because stay tuned, because over Christmas, I am heading down to Key West to visit Nancy and to support um, Key West in their business. We plan on staying down there for Christmas and hopefully over New Year's Eve. So anyways, yeah, I can't wait to see you next week, Carol. Everybody take care. Any more information you want about the work we do, you can visit our website at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, you can also join us here every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern. All right, guys, I got to go train a vulture. See ya. Have a great weekend.